Attack on Titan Final Season Episode 23 is out. And with this new episode, we not only get to see what happens and catch up with the female Titan herself, Annie Leonhardt, but we also get a glimpse of what parody will be like now that Eren is going to commit genocide on a colossal scale. Pun intended. But before I begin, don't forget the colossal Titan, nuke that like button and slide on into that subscribe button's DMs to hit that notification bell. And so without further ado, let's jump right into Attack on Titan Final Season Part 2 Episode 7 titled Sunset. This episode opens up in the Trost District, where we see Hitch Trace of the military police and Annie's ex-roommate, along with some fellow military police troops rescuing parody civilians from the debris created by the still-marching Wall Titans. We see Hitch bring an elderly woman she saved from the debris to a safe zone, where we learn that infighting has already started amongst the parody population about Eren's assault on the outside world. Some blame Eren for the unnecessary destruction of their homes and for the deaths of their loved ones caused by the army of marching titans. But the majority praise Eren's assault on the outside world, noting how these sacrifices are a small price to pay to prevent their entire civilization from being annihilated by their enemies. Hitch alongside other MPs decide that it would be best to arm themselves in case the infighting gets too out of hand. So they head to the military base in the Stoas district to arm up in riot gear. However, upon entering the main building of the military base, Hitch notices a trail of water leading from the basement where Annie was being kept to a nearby room. Following this trail into the room, Hitch ends up getting grappled from behind by Annie. But just as Annie starts threatening her former roommate, Hitch easily disarms and pins down the clearly exhausted female Titan holder. The two then have a little exchange about their shock in Hitch being the one person to show up and her actually being able to pin down the one time seemingly unstoppable Annie. With Annie pinned down, Hitch begins to call out for backup. But Annie, who we now see has cut herself, threatens to turn into a Titan. And as we hear the voice of MPs calling out for Hitch in the distance, our current good gal is left in the tense situation of whether or not to call out her exhausted ex roomies bluff and potentially put her and her fellow soldiers' life at risk by responding to their shouts, or to give in to Annie's demands and help her escape. But before we see just how this dramatic standoff unfolds, the show opening plays, and when it cuts back, we see Hitch in a stable with Annie, helping her escape. Well, fuck me, I guess that's that then. In this stable, Hitch claims that she is only helping Annie escape to save her and everyone else trouble. And Annie reveals that while in her crystalline form, she still retained some form of consciousness, and was able to hear everything Armin and Hitch said to her. So she's up to date on current events. Huh, well that's convenient. Although she does question if Eren seriously plans on destroying the outside world. This questioning is quickly put to rest however, as upon leaving on horseback with Hitch and seeing the army of colossal titans, Annie can confirm that Eren is a crazy bitch that's about to get the highest kill streak you have ever seen. As the two female warriors are traversing through the chaos and carnage that is parody, Annie begins to explain her side of the story to Hitch. She goes on to say that in Marley, she and her fellow Eldians were praised for killing soldiers and civilians alike outside of the Marlian territory. They were deemed as heroes for atoning for their sins as Eldians and every life they took was justified as being necessary to save the world. However, Annie admits that she never actually cared about saving the world, and in fact, she fought for a different reason entirely. And it's here where Annie reveals that she was abandoned at an orphanage by her biological parents, a Marlian woman who had an affair with an Eldian man right after she was born. And she was quickly adopted from this orphanage by a foreign man with Eldian blood, who then proceeded to spend his days relentlessly training Annie into the perfect soldier, so she could become a warrior and give him an easy life. This relentless and brutal training went on for years, until one day Annie finally overpowered her adoptive parent and in a fit of rage age permanently damaged his leg. Yet instead of screaming out in pain, her tormentor cried out in delight, exclaiming, now you can kill without a weapon. From this point forward, Annie believed her only value in life was that of a warrior, and she held no regard for human life, stating that no life had any value, not even her own. 
However, this mentality would all change on the day her and her fellow warriors were to leave for Paradis Island. On the morning before her departure, in a surprising twist, Annie's adoptive parent fell to his knees with tears in his eyes and apologized to her for everything he did. He then proceeded to beg Annie to forget about being a Marley Yin warrior and to just focus on one thing, to come home. And it was in this moment that Annie realized that the man kneeling in front of her truly did care about her. So she fully accepted him as her father and he too fully accepted her as his daughter. And from that point forward, Annie only had one single goal on her mind, return home to Marley to see her father once more. After explaining all of this to Hitch, Annie admits that she has done many, many unforgivable things in her life. But the truth is, she would do them all again if it meant she could see her dad. And following this sentiment, the story cuts over to Marley, where we see Papa Leonhardt along with his fellow Eldians trying to convince the Marleyan guards that Aaron told them he was on his way to kill them all. Unsurprisingly, the guards don't believe the Eldian story that the biggest war criminal in their eyes spoke to them and only them in a unified dream about his devastating arrival. And I mean, when you put it like that, the Marleyan guards, sick of the Eldians' comments, then start to detain the Eldians, accusing them of conspiracy. But Papa Leonhardt, in remembering Annie's teary-eyed promise to return, lets out a rage-filled scream as he charges the guards. But again, before we can see exactly what happens, the story cuts away. This time to Commander Shaddis being bandaged up by the recruits he saved and fought alongside against the Titans. Gunshots can be heard off in the distance as Shaddis informs the young and now loyal recruits that with the rise of the Jaegerists, his time may be coming to an end. And in a heartfelt moment, he tells his young followers to abandon him and join the Jaegerist ranks, to not only save themselves, but also for when the time comes to rise up and fight for what is right. We then cut to a different room where we see Armin gearing up in his ODM gear as Mikasa explains to him that even if he heads straight for Ragako, there is no way he will be able to catch up with Connie. Nevertheless, Armin continues to gear up, as he explains to Mikasa how Gabby and Falco are the key to keeping Reiner and Peek in check. So, to help keep humanity safe and to prevent another 2,000 years of Titan Wars, Armin quite aggressively declares that he's going to tell Connie that maybe his mom should remain as an upside down Titan. That's cold. Armin then says goodbye to Mikasa and goes to leave, but before he does, Mikasa asks him two questions. One, what should she do to help? To which Armin replies by saying she should find a way to help Jean with whatever he's got going on. And the second question she asks is, what should they do about Eren? This question seems to push Armin to his breaking point, as upon hearing it, he immediately breaks down and in a fit of rage, he uncharacteristically shouts at Mikasa about all of the many other problems at hand, such as Flock and the Jaegerists, the unexplained absence of Levi and Hanji, the safety of all of their foreign allies, and the safety of Historia. Armin finally ends this outburst by exclaiming that he doesn't have time to think about Eren. Armin, in realizing he just shouted at his best friend, then apologizes to Mikasa for his outburst. And right before he exits the room, he leaves Mikasa with the final and controversial statement, I know the answer now. I was the wrong person to bring back to life. I gotta say, I kinda agree. Following this, Mikasa notices that her scarf is missing, Gabby says her goodbyes to the Browse family, including Kaya, and Armin and Gabby both leave on horseback together to find and save Falco. The story then cuts to Jean and Flock, where we see Flock has begun intimidating all of the foreign delegates in an attempt to get them to submit themselves to the new empire of Eldia. Flock shoots one of the delegates in the hand for talking back to him and he explains that they all now have nothing to their name. No military, no backup, no country, no home. 
so it would be best for them to just submit. In hearing this, the delegate Flock, previously shot, then begins to speak up again against Flock. But before he can say too much, Flock, to Jean and everyone else's shock, executes him in front of everyone. With this display of showing what happens to those who oppose him, Flock commands the delegates to return to their cells to think over whether they want to die a meaningless death like their friend, or to accept his offer and submit to Eldia. As the delegates begin to leave, Mikasa arrives on the scene, and Flock then informs both Mikasa and John that he is just acting under Eren's orders, and that they shouldn't worry, as after countless years of war and horror, they have finally achieved their true goal, freedom. Flock informs a still in shock Jean that now he can finally go back to being the old Jean, the reckless, annoying, and shaky person who wanted to take the easy life with the military police. In hearing this, Jean, still in shock, asks Flock to repeat what he said. But before he does, Jean makes eye contact with Anya Capone, who is leaving the room with the rest of the delegates, and he freezes up. Finally, Mikasa speaks up and she asks Flock what exactly happened to Levi and Hanji, to which Flock slyly replies that unfortunately they were killed by Zeke. You lying bastard. The story then briefly cuts over to Falco and Connie, where we see a conscious Falco who, due to his Titan transformation, can't remember anything that happened past meeting up with Colt and Gabby, so he doesn't know his brother is dead, and he possibly doesn't remember his confession of love to Gabby either thanking Connie for saving him and bringing him to safety. As it turns out, Connie has convinced the trustful Falco that he was knocked unconscious during the fighting, and he is bringing him up to a hospital up north before getting the young boy back to the Marleyan airships. But during the ride, we do see some hesitation in Connie, as he thinks about how he wants to finally show his mother he became a soldier who protects people just like she always wanted him to be. But at the same time, Time he will have to sacrifice a child to do it. And with this, episode 23 comes to an end, as we get a quick glimpse of Peak and General Maggot out in the forest, noting how they're being left behind so the airships can get back in time to warn Marley, before the both of them cross paths with Hanji and a heavily injured and not shirtless, apparently he wasn't a manga, Levi. Overall, this was another great episode, and as you can probably guess by the length of this video, there was a lot going on. Whether it was Annie's escape with Hitch, Annie's backstory, Shadis' final command, Armin's outburst, Armin's hunt with Gabby, Flock's revelation of power, Jean's inner turmoil, Connie and Falco's escape, or even the return of Levi and Hanji, there was so much going on, and even the smallest of conversations held important and fascinating details. Yet, even with all of this going on, somehow, no sequence felt too long or too short. Each of these sections had just the right amount of time to fulfill their purpose. It was all beautifully executed. It's also important to note that there was no end credit sequence in this episode. Instead, the credits were just played over the final scenes, which goes to show just how packed this episode was. Although it does have me slightly worried that maybe there's a bit of a crunch going on, and I really hope this doesn't lead to other important scenes not getting the time to shine that they deserve. But let me know what you thought of this episode. Comment your thoughts and opinions below, but remember to keep them spoiler free. If you like this video, don't forget to leave a like. For more content like this, subscribe to the Lunchtime Crew. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Plus Ultra.